Live from Ogasawara, this is the Monster Island Film Vault, Episode 5. John LeMay presents King Kong vs. Frankenstein and continuation, King Kong vs. Godzilla. Hello, kaiju lovers, and welcome to the Monster Island Film Vault, a podcast seeking entertainment and enlightenment through tokusatsu. I am your host, Nathan Marchand, the curator of the Monster Island Film Vault. But joining me today for the first time, in fact, I think this is also his first time here on Monster Island, if I'm not mistaken, is kaiju scholar and author, John LeMay. Hey, Nathan, it's great to be here. Uh, You're right, I haven't been here and I haven't even seen it since uh, 1999. Oh, really? 20 years now. (laughs) Was that yeah, before so it's, it's or really after? really changed a lot. Was it before or after the unfortunate key lock incident, as we call it around? It, it was after. Okay. Only afterwards. Okay. Hey, did, you, did you check out the library? Uh, there's an amazing library here. I use it for reference all the time. I did. It was uh, very well stocked. Yeah, including your books. I always make sure they get to get your books in the library. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. And today, listeners, we have a, a special treat. This is a mini-sode. If you listened to the previous episode on Son of Kong, I mentioned that, well, I should say Jimmy reminded me that I'm skipping King Kong versus Godzilla and going straight to King Kong Escapes because I covered King Kong versus Godzilla in great detail on my previous podcast, Kaiju Vision Radio. If you would like to listen to that episode before continuing with this, I will put a link to it in the show notes. Give it a listen. It's a fantastic episode. So, as a substitute for that, I have brought John on here to talk about a couple of unmade King Kong movies because he has recently published a book called Kong Unmade, The Lost Films of Skull Island that gives a very detailed history about King Kong movies that never got made since the creation of the original film. And today we will be talking about two that are directly tied to King Kong vs. Godzilla. So, without further ado, what is it now, Jimmy? King Kong and Godzilla are getting rowdy because I skipped King Kong versus Godzilla? Oh, great. Do me a favor, Jimmy. Take the orca and see if you can get them to calm down. You still haven't gotten it to work? Do the best you can, all right? Sorry about that, John. That's too bad. Uh, Actually, due to rights issues, King Kong almost wasn't allowed on Monster uh, Island, believe it or not. But I'm, I'm glad to hear that he's here now. Oh, yeah, yeah. In fact, the if you listen to my very first episode, he actually interrupted the recording because <laughs> hmm. he was uh, very excited that I would be covering his filmography first because Jimmy had this crazy idea that all the monsters should hear our broadcast. So he put it out on all the on the PA system and on the loudspeakers. Oh, that's not good. Yeah, we had a we had a talk after that. But anyway, you said you wanted to talk about a couple of other Kong films before we get to these particular two? Yeah, just preceding uh, King Kong versus Frankenstein, there were actually three different sequel slash remake attempts before that. Um, so Marion C. Cooper, right after Son of Kong, he wanted to make a third one. But I believe, as you mentioned in your previous episode, you know, Skull Island actually sunk beneath the waves. So the only way you do a prequel then is kind of like Planet of the Apes, or a sequel is kind of like what they did with Escape from Planet of the Apes. You know, you've got to go back in time and do a prequel, you know. So Cooper thought, well, what if I told the story of Kong's voyage to New York? And so he came up with a storyline called The New Adventures of King Kong. And I guess instead of a prequel, you could call that an in-between quill. I don't know. What would you call that? I called it a mid-quill. I've heard that, a term mid-quill. Float- a, yeah, okay. I've heard that term floated around a few times. I'm not sure if it's official or not. I can't tell you that whenever I write that into a Word document, Spellcheck doesn't like it. <laughs> Yeah, well, okay, I like that term, midquel. So yeah, it was a midquel where Denim is transporting Kong to New York and the ship, the Venture, I think it runs aground and it gets attacked by these sea monsters. So they let King Kong loose to fight off the sea monsters. And then he swims away to a nearby island and escapes and they have to recapture him. And that was the idea for the new adventures of King Kong. Then Cooper had another idea that he wanted to film in Technicolor. And this would have been a prequel. It wouldn't have been a midquel. It, it would have been Tarzan versus King Kong. And uh, I don't know any story details, just that it was a prequel on Skull Island. 
then in the 1950s, oh no, go ahead. I was just going to say it would have that would have been interesting to see. I would have wanted to know how the heck Tarzan got to got to Skull Island. <laughs> Absolutely, and and all I know is I don't believe it's related in any way to the Tarzan meets King Kong novel that they did recently. I know it's authorized by the Cooper estate, but I don't think it was based off of any story treatments that I know of. It seems like Um, a natural pairing, I got to say, because I know Edgar Rice Burroughs was an influence on the original film. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, Cooper wanted to make a Tarzan movie at the same time that he made King Kong so he could film them on the same sets, but he uh, didn't realize MGM already had the rights and he couldn't negotiate it, so... Another fun factoid there. But anyway. Yeah, and, and again, you know, in the 1950s, Cooper, there's some debate. Cooper had this project called, alternatively, The Eighth Wonder, and it was also, again, called The New Adventures of King Kong. And some people said that it was going to be a remake of King Kong in color, and other sources said that it was actually going to be his attempt once again to film the New Adventures of King Kong story about the venture running aground and all that. That didn't pan out, but Willis O'Brien was involved with trying to help Cooper get that off the ground, and I think it got it got O'Brien excited to make his own sequel. So he came up with this really ingenious idea for King Kong versus Frankenstein. And ironically enough, it led to King Kong versus Godzilla in 1962. And in in a way, it also led to Frankenstein Conquers the World in 1965. So um, his idea uh, spawned a lot of things. It was 1958, I believe, when he first had the idea. And it's about a descendant of Dr. Frankenstein who sews together different pieces of giant animals in Africa and he makes this giant creature. And at the same time, Carl Denham returns to Skull Island, and he brings Ignoring King Kong that back to the mainland. Son of Kong. <clears throat> That's right. I've always thought that was interesting. Um, so Willis O'Brien, he really didn't like Son of Kong, you know, because he experienced a lot of tragedy during the making of that film. So since O'Brien wrote King Kong versus Frankenstein, I think it's not surprising that he just totally retcons that film. And O'Brien's backstory for King Kong versus Frankenstein is that when Kong fell off the Empire State Building, he didn't actually die. And Carl Denham just smuggled him back to Skull Island so he could live in peace because Carl Denham felt guilty. And uh, for some reason, Denham goes back to Skull Island, though, in this story and recaptures Kong. There's a lot of different versions I've heard of this story because I've never seen the actual treatments for it. So I have to rely on other people's information. But some people say that Denim gets the idea that he wants Kong to fight this Frankenstein monster in a boxing match. I know someone has said that. Yet another source says that Denim goes to Skull Island and he finds a brand new King Kong. It's not the same one from 1933. So I don't really know which source is right until I can actually read that treatment. But, um, you know, as you can imagine, King Kong and the Frankenstein monster, they fight in the streets of San Francisco. And in at least one draft, they climb the Golden Gate Bridge and have a fight on it. And they both fall into the water. And that's how it ends. Mm-hmm. The You have some fantastic concept art to go along with this in your book. I'm looking at it right now. All of it from O'Brien. And I can understand why they would say the, the boxing match idea would be you know likely what they would have tried to do because you know, one of the images on here has what it almost looks like they're doing a weigh-in for boxers you know giving you their stats and their height their weight and everything and i think there's another one another one of the pieces of concept art in here that looks like a stage where they're being shown off yeah they're put on display yeah and yeah uh, so it's almost like this circus sort of a thing going on because they have there's this, another one where there's a trapeze artist walking across a rope that's being held by the well you're calling it the Frankenstein uh, the Frankenstein monster there's also it went by a couple different names like the ginkgo yeah I guess this is a good time to explain that I believe there's three different treatments I don't know if there's a full screenplay for any of them but three treatments the first one was King Kong versus Frankenstein the second one was King Kong versus the Gink Ginkgo. That was also O'Brien. And then the third treatment was King Kong versus Prometheus. That was at the point that it had been rewritten by George Worthington Yates. Mm-hmm. Um, and they were under the impression that Frankenstein was a copyrighted name, so we, we can call it Prometheus because the full title of the novel is 
Frankenstein or a modern Prometheus. So yeah, the monster does have three different names depending on which treatment you go based off of. And I believe one of them is a boxing match, but then another treatment is it's a joint exhibition where they're never intended to fight. They're just put on display together. And the concept art you're were, you were speaking of about Prometheus is holding the wire over his head that the, the lady walks across the tightrope. Mm-hmm. And that's what agitates Kong is he, the lady falls off of the tightrope and I believe Prometheus catches her and this makes Kong angry because he thinks Prometheus is going to hurt the go- girl. So he breaks out of his cage and that's when the fight happens. Taken by itself, all these concepts sound really exciting, I have to say. It's, it is a little unfortunate that they thought the Frankenstein name was copyrighted. You mentioned in the book that it wasn't the name that was copyrighted. It was the appearance. Specific, well, at least the, right. the Boris yeah. Karloff version. They have that trademarked, but the name itself is not, which I th- think is, I thought was, that just seems a little bit weird. It's, you know, it's a piece of classic literature. Can't really copyright that unless it's the author. And I don't think the Shelley estate holds that. I could be wrong on that. No, no, you're right. And uh, I mean, that's just the difference between today and the pre-internet age. I think O'Brien just assumed, uh, you know, Frankenstein was copyrighted. I wish he had been aware of Hammer's Curse of Frankenstein, he might have figured out that, you know, they were able to do their own Frankenstein movie. It's just they they also could not use the uh, Boris Karloff makeup. That was the only difference. So you mentioned there were three treatments. And it was the second and third one where it was the the animals that were sewn together. I, I think in all of them, it is it is animals that are sewn together in all three. Have, but it, again, I yeah, I could have swore that I think in the first draft. No, it was human corpses. I'm looking at it right now. Oh, interesting. Uh, yeah, okay. uh, uh, supposedly you wrote uh, supposedly in the first draft, the giant body was made of human corpses rather than animals. Huh. Okay. See, I don't even remember what I wrote. I've I've written more books since then, and I just ran out of my my hard drive in my mind. Yeah. yeah trust me, I know. <laughs> As a writer myself, you do start to forget some things. <laughs> yeah. That's why I keep Jimmy around. You know, he keeps me straight. <laughs> yeah. So that's what O'Brien was trying to do, which again sounds really exciting. But how did it end up at Toho and eventually metamorphose into King Kong versus Godzilla? So O'Brien and Cooper both kind of felt like they created King Kong and they didn't fully comprehend that at the end of the day, it's RKO who is the one who has to give permission. You know, they just felt like, well, we kind of created him, you know, so we can do whatever we want with him. So I believe O'Brien went to pitch it to RKO and he realized or was told, you don't own King Kong, we own King Kong. You need to find someone who can pay us the licensing fee for you to use King Kong. And so O'Brien got connected to John Beck, who was a producer. And so Beck went out looking for studios to foot the licensing bill. And again, by this point, O'Brien had only written two treatments. And so Beck had had his writer, George Worthington Yates, come on board and write the third and final treatment, King Kong versus Prometheus. And he shopped that around to a lot of people who rejected it. And he finally took it to Toho Studios in Japan. And Toho agreed to pay the licensing fee for King Kong, which would be 220000 U.S. dollars. But because Toho was footing that licensing bill, they felt like, well, we can do what we want. So they basically threw out O'Brien's entire idea and decided instead of Frankenstein, let's have King Kong fight our monster, Godzilla. And so that's how that happened. And there's a few things in King Kong versus Godzilla that are a little bit similar to O'Brien's story, but overall it's an entirely new storyline in some respects. Yes, uh, it most certainly is. And I know that O'Brien was very upset about that. In fact, the, he was horrified at the idea that not only was his idea getting thrown out, that it was being done with Supmation, and yeah, he never even lived to see the movie. No, and, and Cooper was also very upset, and Cooper instigated some sort of lawsuit. I don't remember what came of that, but he, he tried to sue Toho over the whole thing. Uh, it didn't I, get he set, probably just learned. It didn't get settled yeah. until 1980. That's right, yeah. They were both not very happy about it, which is a little ironic because to this day, it's still the highest grossing go- film in the Godzilla franchise, at least in Japan. Yeah, as far as ticket sales go, it sold uh, the most amount of tickets of any Godzilla movie. And yet, the, a lot of Kong's fans and, and his creators are not happy with that movie. 
No, they they are not. And that's probably where another huge divide occurs between King Kong fans and Godzilla fans. And that's why there's a little bit of animosity, perhaps, is, you know, the King Kong purist type fans feel like the Japanese King Kong is some sort of abomination. Yeah, I would be curious to to find out how Mr. Kong feels uh, feels about these uh, this particular era of his filmography, but you know, yeah. it would require Jimmy gets the orca to work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I so so I don't know. Uh, I did read a very interesting essay that talked about that, but you know, that'll get brought up in the in the next episode on King Kong Escapes. Although one interesting thing I did want to mention, you know, you talked about the ginormous fee that Toho paid that ate up a lot of the budget for King Kong versus Godzilla, from what I understand. But it allowed them to use the character for five years. Problem was, is they never That's used, correct. They didn't use that again. Obviously, they tried because we'll get to that. They didn't use the license again until right before it was going to expire with King Kong Escapes. And then, unfortunately, yeah, yeah. because that license expired, Kong did not show up in Destroy All Monsters, with which I think would have been really exciting. I like to think that there's some parallel yeah, universe out there that has a Destroy All Monsters with King Kong. <laughs> Me too. So let's talk about that initial second attempt to have another King Kong movie, which this was fascinating to me because I did not know about this until I read your book. But continuation, King Kong versus Godzilla. They almost had a rematch back in the 60s. Yeah, it was so successful and Toho was so excited. They decided, let's just do another one. Actually, that's presumption on presumption on my part. All I know is there's a treatment by Shinichi, Shinichi Sekizawa called Continuation King Kong vs. Godzilla. And for all we know, that actually could have been uh, one of Sekizawa's unsolicited ideas. You know, I don't know for a fact that Tomoyuki Tanaka actually asked for another one. You know, I just want to throw that possibility out there. But the screen, or the, it's just, it's not a full screenplay. It's just a treatment or a, a fairly lengthy story outline. And what's funny is it, it most definitely evolved into Mothra vs. Godzilla. But uh, in the story, Godzilla's dead body is dredged from the Sea of Japan. And it's put on display in, an, uh, in like an amusement park. And at the same time, uh, King Kong is rediscovered and uh, he heads for Japan. And once they figure out that Kong's headed for Japan, the government decides to revive Godzilla in hopes that they'll fight each other again. And they do this time near Mount Aso, which was also the climax of Rodan. And the uh, story ends with King Kong and Godzilla both falling into Mount Aso into the lava. You left out the most interesting part of the whole thing, though, which was that <laughs> Kong, instead of being infatuated with a, with a young woman, is becoming a surrogate parent to a baby. That's right. Okay, so in greater detail, yeah, the reason why Kong is rediscovered is there's a plane crash of Japanese citizens in Africa. And so a Japanese expedition is, is sent to recover any potential survivors. And there are no, there's no survivors. There's just one tiny little baby survived. And the baby was rescued by King Kong, who developed uh, an attachment to the infant. And what happens is a giant scorpion comes along. And Kong has to set down the baby to fight this giant scorpion. And while that's happening, the leader of the uh, expedition, his name's Nomura, he rescues the baby and runs off to a helicopter and flies away. Kong kills the scorpion and he watches the helicopter fly away. And he has some sort of unspoken uh, psychic link to the baby where he knows where it is. And so he follows the uh, plane back to Japan. And so that's Kong's whole reason for going to Japan is he's trying to reunite with this child that he feels like is his. And I also thought that was a really refreshing idea as opposed to him being enamored with a, a woman. I know. When I read that, I was like, that sounds brilliant. Why hasn't anyone done this? This is one of those story treatments that I almost want to see either made into a fan film or maybe someone turns it into a fan fiction novel or something. I, I want this to exist in some form just because that idea is so interesting. However, it does raise some questions. <laughs> like, okay, he's handling a baby. And Kong is kind of gigantic at this point. How is he going to handle it? I had so many questions. Just the, the size differential was just boggling my mind. If it was the original yeah, Kong, I, I, I get sure. it. But the 45 yeah. meter version in King Kong versus Godzilla, how? 
but it was one of those yeah, things like, you know what, I, I'm just going to go with it. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't think Sekizawa probably thought that out very well. You know, back then, writers, I don't think they really thought about those little details in terms of continuity and just things like that. I, I don't think they did. And you mentioned that this certainly evolved into Mothra versus Godzilla. Yeah. You m- mentioned several things. There's, you know, we have uh, the greedy capitalists. And the Godzilla does get washed up you know, in Mothra versus Godzilla, but you know he's not unconscious, dead, or whatever. And instead of him getting washed up and exploited, it's Mothra's egg. So you can see yeah. where how everything switched over. You know how this led to what we eventually got. Yeah, and just to elaborate, in the first draft of Mothra versus Godzilla, it is his dead body that washes ashore, and they use they exploit that. And then I think in the second draft, he changed it to uh, Mothra's egg, and I think that's what happened. I think the way you describe this is that this is both derivative and highly original, because what Sekizawa did, because he wrote King Kong versus Godzilla, what he does here is he inverses everything. Instead of, exactly. it being, instead of it being Godzilla is attacking Japan, let's get King Kong to fight him. It's King Kong's attacking Japan. Let's make Godzilla fight him. <laughs> and Exactly, yep. Yeah, that's an interesting reversal there, I think. Yeah, I did as well. And then I think the funniest thing is uh, the military makes a giant King Kong decoy and they it's filled with poison and they hoist it up with balloons to intentionally remind Godzilla of the uh, last battle they have. And that's a pretty crazy scene. A continuity. Although, was it poison or dynamite? Uh, I don't remember. I, I might have been both. Yeah, well, that would make sense. It's Godzilla we're talking about here. <laughs> yeah. Let's throw both and, of them at him. Speaking of continuity, I, I think that Sekizawa, when he sets the battle at Mount Aso and has Godzilla fall in, I really think he was probably thinking along the lines of, I'm going to have to do another one. They're probably going to want him to fight Rodan. I'll just make sure he's in the same volcano as Rodan. So that, you know, that's just my speculation there. Well, one interesting thing is I was looking at this. The main character's name is Nomura, and there's a character named Nomura in King Kong Escapes. Oh, I didn't think of that. Good point. Yeah. I just recently watched that movie again in preparation for the podcast. So I'm like, oh, wait, that name. It's like, because that's Akira Takarada in King Kong Escapes, which is funny because that was written by Kimura. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm kind of wondering if maybe that, you know, that was floating around while the two of them were hanging out one day and Kimura's just like, fine, I'll just use the name. <laughs> So um, a lot of people wonder why that movie was never made, and some people thought it was a rights issue, but as you mentioned before, uh, Toho, the rights agreement, it said that they could use King Kong for the next five years, and it's kind of mind-boggling that they never took advantage of that. And adding to the confusion is in 1966, Rankin Bass did an animated television series called The King Kong Show. And some stories say that Rankin Bass approached Toho about doing a a tie-in movie with their TV show and that Toho wrote the movie King Kong vs. Ebera. But actually, I've seen other people say that Toho finally, they were looking at the clock ticking and they realized, wow, we've only got a couple more years to do another King Kong movie. Let's try a King Kong spinoff. And that's the story that I personally prefer about the birth of, uh, you know, Godzilla versus the sea monster is that Toho finally decided, let's make a King Kong spinoff movie. And if it's profitable, maybe we'll renew that licensing fee and we can do King Kong movies. So there's two alternating stories as to how King Kong versus Ebera came to be. You know, again, the first First one is that Rankin Bass actually asked them to write it, and the other is that Toho came up with it on their own, and RKO didn't like the story and rejected it, and it's it's very confusing. Yeah, and then what's funny is, because that was written by Sekizawa, and then he essentially did the 1960s equivalent of find change and just on the script and just swapped out King Kong for Godzilla, which is why yep. Godzilla acts a little weird <laughs> in that movie. Yep. And once I I learned that and I watched the movie, I was like, yeah, this does feel like a King Kong movie. <laughs> it does. And the thing that I really want to know is if, if Mothra was always in it or if they added Mothra in after they added Godzilla in, because I can't get confirmation on that. I do see it in Japanese books. They'll do these pictures of King Kong and Ebra and Mothra, but I don't know for a fact that that isn't their own um, presumption. You know, I won't know whether or not Mothra and King Kong actually met until I see a treatment or a script and I haven't ever actually seen one. 
Oh man, that is one of the most exciting things to think about that we almost had a movie where King Kong meets Mothra. Yeah. I mean, that's and in fact, that's the yeah. stuff of fan fiction right there. Or maybe the monster yeah. first can make it happen now. Who knows? <laughs> maybe, yeah. And actually Mothra the movie was inspired by King Kong as Shiro Honda said to himself. He, you know, he said they wanted to do a movie like King Kong with uh, you know, a tropical island with a monster god on it that comes to civilization due to a beautiful woman and that was the basis of Mothra. So I mean, they're not really that disconnected. <laughs> Hashtag it's all connected. Yeah. <laughs> That is fascinating. It, it's just fun to play what if with all of this, isn't it? That's the whole appeal, I think, of, of this book and all of your and a lot of your other ones, because you've done several Lost Films books. I have. I'm like a junkie for Lost Films. I, I have to find something new to dig up. Which, by the way, listeners, if you're interested, once again, the book is Kong Unmade, The Lost Films of Skull Island, which is available on Amazon. Uh, you can get it in both print and, I believe, ebook. correct? That's right. The ebook won't have any pictures, so it's cheaper. But if you want the pictures, you got to buy the print version. Yeah, the pictures are fantastic, I would like to add. So not only that, but John, you will be rejoining me actually in a few months to talk about King Kong Lives, which I find fascinating because you are actually one of the few people I know who is a fan of that movie. Myself and Justin Mullis are the only two that I know of. Yeah, that should make for a very interesting discussion, to say the least. I'm looking forward to it. Me too. All right. But well, wait, I'm getting a little message here from Jimmy. Oh my gosh, he, he still hasn't gotten the Orca to work, and Godzilla and Kong are still getting rowdy. Oh, my gosh. I'm sorry, John. I'm going to have to cut this short real quick and go take care of that problem. Hey, that's okay, Nathan. I'll, I look forward to King Kong Lives. All right. Well, anyway, thanks, John. Uh, remember, listeners, our next episode is going to be King Kong Escapes with my friend Nick Hayden. See you later. Cue credits. Thank you for listening to the Monster Island Film Vault, a podcast produced and hosted by Nathan Marchand. If you enjoy the show and want to join the discussion, we'd love to hear from you. So email us at feedback at monsterislandfilmvault.com. Your message could be read on a future episode of the show. Our website is monsterislandfilmvault.com. Follow us on Facebook at Monster Island Film Vault and on Twitter, where our handle is the Monster Isla One. You can also follow Jimmy from NASA on Twitter at NASA Jimmy. I have fulfilled my contractual obligations. The podcast logo was created by Tyler Souls from TylerDrawsComics.com. Our theme song is Wander on the Offensive, live edit by B33J, Sarax. Juan Madrano and Nonsensical Lexus, which is a remix of Counterattack Battle with the Colossus and The Open Way Battle with the Colossus by Kowotani from the video game Shadow of the Colossus. It can be downloaded from ocremix.org. All film and audio clips belong to their respective copyright holders and no infringement is intended or implied. The show is available on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, YouTube, and other fine podcatchers. Please rate and review the podcast to help spread the word about the show. The Monster Island Film Vault is a Moonlighting Ninjas Media production. Sayonara! <laughs>